You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, listeners should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Individuals should not enter into an options transaction until they have read and understood the disclosure document, characteristics, and risks of standardized options. Available by visiting the OCC.com or by contacting your broker, any exchange on which options are traded, or the Options Clearing Corporation at 125 South Franklin Street, number 1200, Chicago, Illinois, 60606. The Options Industry Council is an industry resource provided by the Options Clearing Corporation, collectively OCC. Any strategies discussed are strictly for illustrative and educational purposes only and are not to be construed as an endorsement or solicitation to buy or sell securities. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of several resources investors can utilize to learn more about options. Other resources OIC offers include webinars, articles, and self-guided options-related coursework. For more information, check out www.optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Benzaquin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to OIC's Wide World of Options. I'm your host, Mark Benzaquin. For today's episode, we're continuing to feature conversations that we had with some of the industry's biggest names at the recent Options Industry Conference in Asheville, North Carolina. Today, we're featuring Ariane Adams of Webull, who will tell us her views on market accessibility and potential for future growth. Uh, we'll also have a visit with Lex Lutheran Housing from Tradier, who gives us his opinion as to whether or not the market is a level playing field for all investors. And finally, J.J. Kinahan of IG North America, better known to our listeners as Tasty Trade, as J.J. talks about the early days of trading and where he sees the market going forward. For those interested in our webinar program and what OIC has in store for August, we're continuing our summer with a deep dive into selling straddles, strangles, and ratio spreads, amongst others. To register, please visit our optionseducation.org website and click on the Events tab. For our Wide World of Options podcast, however, we're excited to bring you more of our extended Tales from the Road as we've been traveling, meeting new friends, and having great conversations about options. We should note that as our guests are not directly affiliated with OIC or OCC, the opinions expressed are their own and not necessarily those of OCC, nor do we endorse, warrant, or guarantee the products, services, or information discussed by our guests. And with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started by listening into a conversation that we had with Arian Adams, Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Derivatives at Webull. I had the good fortune to meet Arian when we caught up with her at the recent OIC Options Industry Conference in Asheville, North Carolina, where we discussed a variety of topics, including market accessibility, popular misconceptions about options, and potential opportunities for growth. Let's go ahead and listen in now. All right, everybody, we are sitting down once again at the Options Industry Conference. Uh, I'm very fortunate that Ariane Adams from Webull has joined me. Uh, Ariane, 
has had several positions, uh, many venerable names in the industry, including vice president roles at Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, and CBOE. Uh, now Marianne is the uh, chief strategy officer and head of derivatives at Webull. Uh, Arian, with all that experience that you have working with investors, let me ask you this question. Um, investors often feel that maybe there's an unlevel playing field in the industry, meaning um, at our investor education desk, we often get um, emails and, and live chat with uh, investors thinking that the big banks have an advantage over the small time investor and it's not entirely a level playing field. How would you address that question? Well, I think it's a great question and to lead off our conversation today. So I'm looking forward to having this discussion and thanks for having me here today. One, we've seen unprecedented growth in the industry. So with unprecedented growth, there tends to be um, lags in technology and development to meet the demands of all the customers and all the investors. I'd say um, there's been um, a substantial amount of resource and spend on the technology side for institutional investors who've historically used this product as a way to diversify their investment profile. What we've seen is, an, is a significant growth, larger than the, in, the institutional investor base from retail brokerage platforms as well as the retail, i.e. the retail investor. As a result of this demand increasing, what we've seen is maybe not as many tools or applications to, be, to allow them to transact as easy as maybe an institutional firm who've been granted the tools because the resources have been spent over the last 20 years to allow them to enter orders as easy as possible. In my current role, we are um, seeing an evolution of users, not unlike the institutional where we might have long only retail and long only institutional asset managers to the most sophisticated vol arb systematic um, uh, traders. And with those, you can see there's varying degrees of tools that might be needed to be offered for that investor base, point and click to algorithmic to systematic algorithmic to API tools that allow them to transact or execute the strategy. We're seeing that evolution start to emerge, not as severe in the, as the institutional space, but the, with the retail community. Meaning the retail community were historically just started to dabble years and years ago in options and they might have only needed point and click or just easy access to the marketplace. Now that user base is getting, more sm is getting smarter about the product, about the risks, um, and they're asking and needing for more sophisticated tools from all the retail brokerage platforms, i.e. that um, evolution of that customer is happening very quickly, and we're seeing varying degrees of demands from our customers. And I think because the technology has not been spent there, but we're all rapidly trying to catch up with this increase in volume, you're going to start to see an increase in tools and applications to be able to make that level playing field look a little bit cl closer to par or on even playing field as than what we maybe might be seeing right now. So in, in your opinion, one of the um, differences between a uh, retail investor and, and, for example, Wall Street is technology, the, the access to that technology to, um, in terms of information, speed of uh, execution, et cetera. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, li I like using access a lot. Um, and even in my prior role at SIBO, as well as my current role, we're constantly getting asked on how can I gain access to one of the most liquid markets, not only the U.S. equity market, but the U.S. listed options market. Um, and how we could help solve that is not only granting access, tools, applications, front ends, GUIs, and uh, solutions to allow that order to get to the marketplace, but also getting those people to those tools to be able to enter that order. That's, that's problem one, and problem two is then giving them the tools that they need to execute more effectively. Interesting. I like that. Thank you. Uh, so with this new influx of uh, uh, volume, new influx of trader, the, a new demographic, uh, uh, I just had Kevin Davitt from the NASDAQ speak with me, and we were talking about this uh, new demographic of trader. Um, this new demographic, they don't have a, they're not seasoned, obviously. They don't have a grasp on you know, the ins and outs of options. They may not fully understand volatility. They may, may not fully understand corporate actions, um, you know, and, and things that affect their trading account. At Webull, what is your approach to education, the importance of education to investors, uh, as well as how you approach that? Yeah, no, um, education is the critical component to the growth and the further growth of this industry. 
and the ability for us to provide access to education, whether that's our own education materials for our users or joint partnerships to allow this industry and these users to be able to educate themselves prior to entering their first trade. Um, it's critical that we make those steps or methodical on it and what kind of tools that um, we offer to be able to get it as easily as possible. And I think that's why we've seen the growth that we've seen where that material is getting more readily available. There's more avenues for people to get educated quicker. And actually, I do think that we're seeing the turn that they have gotten educated. Um, and that, I've seen that in the demographics of volume, meaning it, to start, maybe there was a customer that might have uh, expressed a view in a stock by buying a call or buying a put. What you're starting to see is that evolution of, I want to roll that position I want to maybe spread that position, or I want to um, do multiples of those, and then I want to hedge the position with an underlying ETF or an index option. So that's showing me that they're not only getting the grasp of understanding what an option can do from a diversification of a portfolio standpoint or expressing a view, they're also using it from a hedging standpoint. And then furthermore, they'll be able to spread or use complex instruments to be able to express more um, I'd say sophisticated um, opinions by utilizing um, option spreads shows that the education is working and mm -hmm. we're seeing a multiple amount of people starting to get educated at a faster pace. But there's still a lot of work to be done. There, there certainly is. And, and part of that work is uh, maybe dispelling some misconceptions about options. You know, do you have a, do you come across any misconceptions that people have about options? Uh, do you think there's things that uh, particularly new investors misunderstand, um, and that misunderstanding can lead to a, an unsatisfactory experience trading options? I, um, I probably I echo those thoughts in terms of the misconceptions. I've heard very similar um, um, headlines that I've heard, as well as I think the media also yeah. overemphasizes um, those misconceptions and risk, which is unfortunate. And I think it's our job as industry leaders to dispel those um, myths as much as we possibly can. I think there's more people in the industry that are aligned with that because what we realize is how fantastic this utility and this product is for a, a person's portfolio when understanding uh, the demographics of the product, edu properly getting educated, and, and the risk attributed to it, just like the risk attributed to trading an equity or an option, or excuse, excuse me. So I think that the, the ability for us to continue to dispel those myths um, is, the, is the step that we're at right now, especially when I, um, in my prior role, there was a tremendous amount of a risk around um, or headlines around VIX. Um, and they would call it the fear factor and, and how, you know, challenging or, you know, that product can be um, and, and hard to understand. And I think that maybe the pe person who's actually articulating that point is probably the person that maybe does, needs also the education to help them understand the value of that product. Mm -hmm. So dispelling those myths. Uh, understanding the market, those might be some of the key challenges we have um, as uh, you know, industry professionals. What about uh, opportunities? What uh, opportunities do you see going forward in the industry? Right. I think I, I'll, I'll pull up on a, We've already talked a lot about technology, but I think now next is solving the access gap problem. Um, I would say only a percentage of our user base um, at Webull and even generally in the industry trade U.S. equities or a local equity and have an only a smaller percentage, call it 5, 10, 15, 20%, depending on the firm you're at, um, use options as well. So it is, there's, there's a way to go in terms of opportunities and conversion there. Sometimes I believe that it's an access problem. So there might be someone who has access to equities, but maybe they don't have access to a derivatives product to hedge or properly hedge their portfolio. So that's kind of knocking down the barriers, whether it's jurisdictional barriers, um, it's product barriers or um, technology barriers, are areas where we see a strategic growth opportunities um, uh, that will allow to um, enhance or continue to grow this industry. I think that opportunities are pretty astounding as you knock down those boundaries, whether that's in a given um, industry, or excuse me, given region, 
um, as well as a given um, offering. I think the other part, which is interesting, is as we see more and more demand come out of non-domestic regions, whether that's Europe, whether that's in Asia, or everyone talks a lot about India right now, it's the ability for us to um, provide access overnight. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, at SIBO, we obviously do it for a couple of proprietary products, not unlike what the CME does for futures businesses, um, but the ability for us to start to think about providing access around the globe or 24-5, um, I think unlocks or provide, provides an opportunity for the industry to continue to grow. So you, you think that 24-hour option trading is on the horizon? I do think so. Yeah. I think the clearly the first step in, in expanding the U.S. options industry is, is allowing the U.S. equity industry to be able to trade overnight um, with um, the proper regula regulations as well as the SIP being able to be disseminated overnight, um, which then allows us to have the proper hedge for a U.S. listed option to um, have what a liquid marketplace, a liquid hedge um, for us to contemplate listing options overnight. Uh, that will take a tremendous amount of time, but I think that is the right foresight to be able to Think about where we might be in five years. Interesting. Well, I, I'm glad that I'm off the trading floor now, so I don't have to worry about, you know, trading 24 hours uh, around the clock. But uh, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Excellent information. Uh, Arian, thank you so much for sitting down with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And we're back. Thank you to Arian Adams of Weeble for taking the time to sit down with us and for the great conversation. Next up is Lex Lutheran Housing of Tradier, with whom we had an interesting discussion of emerging technology, especially the role of AI, and whether, in his opinion, whether the market is a level playing field. Let's go ahead and listen in now. Welcome back, everybody. I am extremely fortunate to be sitting with Lex Lutheran Housing of uh, Tradier, the Senior VP of Partner Relations and Chief Content Officer. Uh, Lex got his started back on the floor of the CBOE, as did many of uh, uh, my friends here in the industry that we've been speaking with. You know, back in 1987, trading equities, he founded Boda Trading in 92, became involved in trading software, and created Tradehawk in 2016 before joining Tradier as the Senior Vice President in 2020. Also an alum of Notre Dame, uh, so I'm assuming Rudy is probably one of your favorite movies? <laughs> well, Rudy's one of my favorites. Yeah, you sure. probably get that asked that a lot, <laughs> I would expect. Um, so, Lex, let me ask you this. Um, you created uh, software for Tradehawk back in the day. Obviously, technology and innovation is important to you. How do you assess the role of technology uh, in driving innovation within the markets? Yeah, so we, we we started in the technology space even in our pro days when we were market makers. Um, we were one of the first to have you know machines on the trading floor. Okay, so that sort of that background stuck with me. Um, I think as I started you know phasing out of the market maker side of the business and getting into the retail side of the business, it became even more important. Right, for retail trading. Yeah. So we developed a platform as you as you refer to it, Tradehawk. It became a uh, a retail sophisticated trading platform, something that has a lot of bells and whistles. So you can you can go anywhere in it to find your right. your trade idea. Yeah. Um, and I think you know from the retail side of the equation, those folks are really looking for a trade idea generator. So we tried to solve that problem. So we tried to give them a lot of data, um, a lot of volatility data, a lot of charting data, um, even strategy type data within the platform. Um, the other thing that I'm seeing today is the uh, the advent of the the bot. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So we have several partners who have who've structured their business around bots, and all that means is a fancy word for robot, right? But it's a it, it means that. You're making a workflow that's automated, right? As a as a retail person. Okay. Um, and once that workflow is automated, it takes that emotion out of the equation, and that's very critical for retail Absolutely. people. Absolutely. They tend Absolutely. to they tend to get you know engulfed in, in emotionalism. Um, so we're seeing that as a as a really popular um, technology innovation that's helping those folks out. Okay. Um, Right. And how is, so let me, uh, you know, transition that into the next question. How is AI going to affect all that? Well, we're, we're starting to see a little bit of that with, uh, with AI. Um, I think it's in its infancy relative to the trading side of it, only because you know, AI still can't figure out 
sell here, buy there kind mm -hmm. of thing. It hasn't done that yet, at least not well as from what, what I can see. Um, but what it also helps is a little bit of the, the workflow message as well. One of the new um, technology platforms that I'm dealing with, and I, I can't say any names right now, um, they can actually read a chart, whether it's a minute, day, whatever. Okay. And you can spit it through their AI machine, and it'll give you an analysis of chart pattern or price action and give you a suggested direction. Interesting, okay. Um, so we're seeing, and that's an all AI based. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Now, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not right. sure yet. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's probably just as accurate as you know anything else in the world. Yeah, yeah. you know we we've got all of our charts, we've got all of our indicators. Get in here, get out here, and right. uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right, right, right. Yeah, interesting. Um, so you know, talking about retail, um, you were mentioning retail versus market makers versus institutional um, retail, especially newer investors, mm -hmm. in my opinion, uh, often feel that uh, they're playing on an uneven playing field in terms of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. uh, simply put, do you think that they're right? Um, what, uh, do you, are they correct in that assessment? What do you think? Um, well, I love this question, by the way. So um, I think there's a, it's a two-part answer, right? There's a yes and no to the, to the answer to the question. They can't be in the bid-ask game. What I mean by that is that's what market makers do. They buy their bid, they sell their, sell their offer, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I preach this around the country. Don't get caught up in between that market. You're, not, you're never going to buy a bid. You're never going to sell an offer. You have to have another edge in the marketplace. Um, I think the ones I talk to understand that. So it, the first part of the question is the uh, part of the question is that the market making community definitely has an advantage over the retail community because they can buy their bid and sell their offer. Right. That's their edge proposition, right? Um, so I said, get that out of your mind. You have to have a new set of edge. Uh, in terms of you know the institutional folks, the only edge I see there is that they have a team of analysts and a team of quants and a team of whatever right. who, can, who can process a trade idea and, and, and bring it to, you know, uh, to, to fruition. Typical retail person doesn't have that. Right. So it's he or almost, she has to dig. They don't have the, for lack of a better word, infrastructure that right. you know a professional Wall Street firm might have. Probably not. No, I would say not. So is that a disadvantage? I guess it's a little bit. But you know, the retail per person has really gotten a, a, a great new set of tools, and it's democratized the, in the industry. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can get into the game with a, a very inexpensive computer. You can open an account with very little money. Now, so you know, look at I. I kind of think. Part of the reason I got into this part of it is because it got to be a little overwhelming on the professional side, and it got so cheap on the retail side mm -hmm. to play this game um, that I, I think I liked it better. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you know, with the obvious things that I can't buy my bin somewhere, I, I come from the market making community. So well, and but also, I mean, with the influx of so many bodies now trading. Uh, Bid ask markets have become so much, uh, you know, tighter. So if if the market's one bid at, at uh, you know one hundred and two, right. does it really matter that you're you know paying one hundred and one or no. even you know paying the offer? It's, it doesn't matter. No, that's a pick 'em. That's yeah, a pick 'em right. Pick so em. that's yeah. that's okay. And I think you know again one last point on this is that um, what the retail person has is he or she has time. So you know you you have the ability to put something on intelligently and have a little time for it to develop. Your entry point is probably a little negative edge, but your your horizon can make it make it much more positive, mm -hmm. so especially if you're disciplined, right? Right, right, certainly. And and that was something that uh, you know I would talk to people when they're asking the difference between a, a retail investor versus a market maker, for mm -hmm. example. A market maker doesn't care if you're trading calls or puts. They don't care if they're buying or selling. All they want is that edge that you had That's mentioned. Right. Whereas the retail investor, they've got their forecast. Mm -hmm. You know, they want something to happen, whether it's you know good, bad, or indifferent. Yep. Um, but uh, they have a different objective than the market maker. Absolutely. Typically. That's right. Yeah. And then, and then you know, the, the markets themselves are so much more accessible now. There's so many people uh, trading. Education is uh, all over the place. Sure. People are... Uh, Investors are finally understanding what it is that they're getting themselves into. Um, and part of that, I think, is due to these uh, advanced trading platforms, the bells and whistles that you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. So why don't we talk about that, um, discuss the evolution of trading platforms, if you would, uh, technologies, uh, techno technology solutions, mm -hmm. uh, and how you think that's impacted everything. Yeah, so um, back to the tr trade idea generator, you know, when we first started in the business, we did our, our deltas and our Greeks on a, on a little right. card, right? right. Um, that's come a long way. So uh, I think 
the, the trading platform has to be something that um, opens up the flow of, of ideas for a, a retail trader. The retail trader, in my opinion, is, is kind of, he, he blocks the flow. Mm-hmm. So if we can make the technology piece um, so efficient and almost so automated, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it, it makes that retail person's life so much easier. You can't imagine the mistakes that a retail person makes. Um, and, it, you know, look at it. Some of it's a little ex- inexperienced. Some of it's fear. Right. Some of it's capitalization. I get that. Yeah. But a lot of it's emotion, and, the, and they don't have a, a discipline pattern. You know, we grew up in the business on the market maker side. We were taught certain discipline. Um, now the trading technology and the platforms have built in discipline to some to a large degree, most of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, clearly the, the very basic ones are, are, are don't have that. But our platform at, at Trade Year is very sophisticated. Um, it can be as as intricate or as easy as you want it to be. Yeah, and that helps that person, I think. Right. Tell me, right. Uh, tell me more, if you would, about these bots that you were talking about. Uh, examples of what it can and cannot do. Yeah. So. Um, I've seen them as, as, as sophisticated as natural language learning, where you could type in something and it'll pull the code out for you. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably on the higher end. And I've also seen something that is, um, has a library of commands, you know, if, then, statements, and, right. or, that sort of thing. And you can build your own bot by dragging those commands into condition one, condition two, condition three, condition four. Okay. Okay, and then once you have that condition, the machine will make sure the logic is correct so that if there's a loop or any sort of illogical expression, right. it'll tell you that. Right? You can test that. And then once you have it right, give it a name, save it, and you can use that particular workflow, a bot, hmm. over and over again. Yeah, uh, interesting. It's, and it's, they're pretty amazing. We have, we're, we have several now that we're, we're in partner with who okay. uh, are doing it well. Do, um, let, me, let me take that a step further. Do you think that we're going to get to the point... Um, you had mentioned something about this a little earlier. Do you think we're going to get to a point where the the bots or AI mm-hmm. specifically will make trading decisions for us at some point? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm so I'm so I'm not sure about that. Here's why: um, take airline travel. Okay. Right. Uh, very automated. They have pretty much robots that can take that plane off and land it mm-hmm. um, without the, the, the need of a pilot. But don't forget what the pilot does. He inputs the coordinates, right? So he's putting in the, the dials and making sure it's at the right level and all the wings are set right. Um, I think the AI part of trading, I think you're still going to need to have a mind behind it, a human mind behind it mm-hmm. um, to sort of you know build that workflow. Now, I could be wrong. I mean, maybe... T- 15 years from now, that workflow is built right, for you. Say, knows. hey, I want to be a swing trader and I want to make yeah. uh, 40 cents on every trade I make. Figure it out. I mean, that, that right. would be wonderful. I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, I, I, I just don't, I, th- I think even though there, there's a lot of AI there, I still think the human has to kind of make sure the, the flow of, of uh, ideas works well. Yeah. Uh, Lex, this was wonderful. I really appreciate you stopping by. This Thank was a you. good time. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Mark. Appreciate You're it. welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lex, for that terrific discussion and for your insight into the future of trading. And now to close things out, let's go ahead and listen into our talk with J.J. Kinahan of IG North America, again, uh, better known as uh, Tasty Trade to most of our listeners. Let's go ahead and listen in what J.J. has to say. Welcome back, everybody. I have the extreme fortune of sitting with J.J. Kinahan, CEO of IG North America. Uh, J.J. began his career back on the CBOE as a market maker back in 1985, worked his way up through the industry, including a 16-year stop at TD Ameritrade, where he was the managing director of Trader Services before joining Tasty Trade in 2022. Along the way, J.J. was uh, invited to be a board member of OCC and CBOE's advisory board. He's also a frequent contributor to Forbes, CNBC, acclaimed author of Essential Option Strategies, a uh, very busy, busy man. Um, with all that said, JJ, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, let me ask you this. A long, illustrious career in options. Um, you've learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes along the way, I would expect, just like everybody else. Um, is there something that sticks out to you now, with uh, top of mind, where you're like, boy, if I only knew that going in, things would have been so much different? <laughs> well, there's a lot, and to your point, Mar, I've made so many mistakes along, uh, along the way, and one of the things I enjoy is uh, always been teaching people. Yeah. Uh, I've always really, really liked that part of uh, my job. I don't get to do it as much anymore. 
But I would say the biggest thing I've learned, and I think this is youth as well as experience, is not to get too high or too low. Okay. And I think when you first start out, you know, every loss is just such a punch in the gut. Not that, you know, if I lose $5, I'm still pissed. <laughs> but right, right. you learn how to, and, 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 you know, when you have good days to be like, all right, that's fantastic, but tomorrow's a new day. You know, it's the, uh, the old Marine thing. The only easy day was yesterday. And so I really think that learning how to, people say control your emotions, it's, it's money. You, so you're always going to be emotional about it. But I think the biggest thing that I learned, and I hope that the retail traders listening to this learn, is to really start small. Yeah. Because when you do that, that money, you know, the first few trades that 80 or or $100, you'll have enough pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. and, but most importantly, you'll have learning in there. The easiest thing in the world to do is to become a bigger trader. The hardest thing to do is to lose capital early and try and make it up. Yeah, I, I remember obviously a distinct difference between uh, an investor and a market maker. Um, I remember starting out in the business, I was clerking for uh, somebody in the OEX who I'm, I'm sure you know that. Uh, but I was, I, won't in there, I was in there for a lot of years. Yeah, and, and I remember there was a big, um, I don't know if it was an unexpected Fed uh, announcement, either a rate cut yep. or a, a rise, uh, but one of the guys that I was clerking with, with, I was looking at his PL the next day, like, you know, as a clerk, I always do set everything up for him. And he lost, uh, I don't know, like $225,000 overnight, uh, unexpectedly. And as a, a clerk who started out on the floor making, you know, $18,000 a year, I, you know, approached him and said, you know, how do you come back to work knowing that you just lost more money than the average American family makes in, you know, four or five years? Um, and he had said that, uh, you know, if there was a stack of cash next to me and it got bigger or smaller with each trade that I did, I would trade one lots all day long. Right. And, and, you know, it's an interesting story because actually you made 18th. Wow. I made $750 a month as a clerk, <laughs> but I used to bounce at a bar every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night to make extra money. But, uh, that all said, you know, I actually remember the day it was a fed rate cut. The markets in Chicago closed at three o'clock. The Fed news came out, surprise rate cut at 225 in the mm. afternoon. I remember the day like it was yesterday. It's it, interesting how these really good or really bad days leave such an impression in your mind. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the again, things to be learned on that day in terms of keeping your positions in control and really understanding your risk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me ask you this. Let me shift gears for a second. Um, where do you see the market going? What, and not, you know, bullish, bearish, but what trends do you see in the industry? Uh, Technology-wise, sure. uh, access to the market-wise, yeah, um, et cetera. What, what uh, significant trends do you see coming up? Well, I think one of the biggest things has been the short-dated options. Some call them zero-day options, et cetera. Uh, they're not zero-day options. It's just that we have an expiration every single day. Those options are at least been on the board for a week. Mm -hmm. But all that being said, they have been very popular. There's no question about it. But I think people are losing sight of one of the reasons they're so popular. There's two things going on about them. A, the, you know, people's average attention span is so much shorter. You know, when I started out on the retail side of the business, we were flying around the country doing seminars for hopefully two, 300 people. Now you do only a few of those a year and you're aiming for 800 or 1,000 people on a Saturday. And the other thing is, you know, you have to use social media and short hits to get people interested in the longer bits where they can learn. Right. Now, all that said, let's take that so people's attention spans are shorter, they want more immediate gratification. I think that plays into it. But what's also playing into it, and this is not being publicized, is think about the environment right now. We have been talking about Fed rate hikes or Fed rate cuts. There were six expected Fed rate cuts coming into this year. Now, as of, you know, Chairman Powell, as we speak, Chairman Powell spoke yesterday saying, we may not get one this year. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to me. So what does that mean for the average retail trader? It means that they're a little more afraid to put money out on a, on a directional move in time. They have more confidence in the short term. What we're starting to see more is an adjustment of directional type plays, be they vertical spreads, et cetera, to a more compressed time period. And what you're starting to see on the longer time periods is what I would call more investment 
or uh, you know, addition, additional return type of strategies. The covered call, the cash covered put, where people are just enhancing their returns, or a stock substitute, you know, sell your stock, buy a deep in the money call, and sell another call against it type thing. Those are the longer term plays you're seeing. Mm-hmm. And that is being under publicized as to why people are doing that. And I would expect that trend to continue at least through the new year as we come into this election. And, you know, I don't think the interest rate picture is going to get settled any time throughout the year, partly because of that. And when we do and we see who's in what seats, maybe you start to get a little bit of a settlement from that point. Yeah, you know, it was interesting that you bring up the election. I um, uh, had the the fortune of catching a panel just a little bit ago where they were talking about uh, market volatility in an Mm -hmm. election year. Um, And what was interesting is that when uh, Trump was president, everyone expected the world to end. Um, And the market survived. The market did very, very well. When Biden was elected, everybody expected the world to end and uh, the market to crash and the market survived and, you know, record highs. The point being is that regardless of who's sitting in the Oval Office, the market's doing pretty well. I thought that was kind of interesting um, that we may not necessarily get the volatility from who is elected president, Mm -hmm. um, but we may get that volatility from maybe contesting the election, something like that. Well, I I think one of the things you have to do as a trader is put your emotions, again, as much as possible aside. You know, you may feel more loyalty to one presidential candidate or the other, one side of the House or the other, be it Democrat, Republican, whatever it may be. How you feel personally is not what's necessarily happening in the market. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's a bit of a skill to do that. And you can have your opinions, and you're going to have bad trades. That's part of life, and that's why we always talk about defining your risk up front. But you really have to say, well, oh, my God, I, you know, as an example, I support Republicans, so if a Democrat's in the world's going to hell, or I support Democrats, so if the Republicans right. get in the world's going to hell. Forget that. The market doesn't care. The market cares about what do we think the policies are going to be. They're going to help drive earnings, because at the end of the day, earnings drive the market. And so that's what you really have to look at. Separate who you're voting for for what the market's telling you is going on at that moment. Yeah, and and again, that pile of cash next to you, if it were real, got bigger with every trade or smaller, leaving that emotion out. I want to visit that for a second because I think one of the greatest things that retail traders are really good at and never given credit for is how fantastic they are at managing their capital. When I was trading in the pit, I never thought to myself, I can't make this trade because I don't have enough money in my account or it's too big. You know, you manage your risk, of right. course. What retail traders have to do because, by and large, they have a limited amount of capital. Maybe they have 50000 in their account, 100000 a million, whatever it may be. They're like, okay, I can put this much money at risk to that trade because I have to manage the rest of my capital. And retail traders are really, really smart, really, really good at that. And it's one of the reasons when we educate, we talk about doing smaller trades and waiting maybe for some movement to do another trade because you want to manage that capital in the best way possible. And it's what options allows you to do is to really manage that capital efficiently. And as I said, as people become more educated and start to understand the products a little better, they do such a good job of it. I never hear people give uh, retail traders credit for it. and They're absolutely awesome. Hmm. I like that. Thank you. And and you're right. Retail traders really don't get uh, the credit. You know, we speak to many, many of them on the investor education desk. Um, And, you know, what I've noticed is, number one, they're they're educated more than they used to be. They Absolutely. Do, they know more um, uh, more about the, the industry. They know more about strategies. They go into trading with their eyes wide open more so than they used to in the past. There's no question about it. Again, you know, I've spent a lot of my career educating people, and I really feel good when people come back and you see them at, you know, maybe you saw somebody at some event five, ten years ago, and they're like, oh, my God, here's what's happened in my life, and it's been very positive, and, you know, you helped in some of the education. You can't help but feel great about that. Yeah. I encourage everybody at our firm to go to the events, meet the clients. People are really happy to talk to someone who's trying to help them. And that's our responsibility as an industry, not just our firm, not any one firm, not just the exchange, not just you guys. We owe it to people. That's how you grow an industry is helping people understand how great it is and how their quality of life would be their goal, something small, their kid going to college, a wedding, whatever it is. Their quality of life can improve once they start to understand this stuff. Yeah, and and you guys are out 
meeting the investor where they are. I know Tasty travels the country yes, um, having these uh, seminars. You know, I certainly follow you on social media. Jamal's a good uh, a friend of OIC. Um, when you meet these investors, uh, what opportunities do you see for them in the future? Or um, on the other side, what key challenges are, are you seeing? Well, I think the key challenge for everybody is having a failure and being like, oh my God, I'm not smart enough for this. They screwed me, <laughs> whatever it yeah. may be. And so again, I, 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 I hammer the same themes a lot. Stay small. So one setback, okay, what did I learn from it? And it didn't cost me a ton of money to learn that. Now here's how I'll adjust that until you get the hang of it. Mm-hmm. And just like everything else. So you know, when, you, when you and I were in the pits, when I started trading, I'll never forget my first day I'm going down to the pit, you're so nervous, right? Yeah. And at the time, the OEX was the biggest pit in the world, and I was going to be the youngest person to step in there. I was 22 years old. And I'll never forget as I'm going down, the guys who started me in the business said, oh, by the way, in six months after expenses, if you're back to zero, welcome aboard. We're so happy to have you. If you're not, it's been great knowing you, and thanks. <laughs> when you hear that, you know, as right. you're walking down the first time, it makes you a little scared. Yeah. But the point being... And it's certainly you know, hard to keep the emotion out of trading. It's when you're impossible. Thinking, you know, wow, you're shaking my the first job's time. My job's on the line. The first time, well, I mean, luckily I had nothing, so yeah. I lived in a, you know... 500 square foot apartment and uh, studio. And, you know, as I said, I was bouncing on weekends still. But uh, what it did do is it's like, okay, once you figure it out, once you get over being frightened, what they're basically saying is you're not going to be very good at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So learn, keep your trading and your losses small so that as you start to learn, all of a sudden it'll click. And as I tell people who, you know, I, I've ever done any education with, teach people how to break even. Yeah. Because once you learn how to break even over time, making money sort of takes care of itself because you don't have those giant losses anymore. Hmm. And I think it's a really important message for particularly those just starting out to understand. Nobody became great at this right away. And again, when we were doing it, what it was probably about a 25% survival rate after one year of new people yeah. who were stepped into the pit. And again, it's not pit trading anymore, but some of the concepts certainly go a long way. So if you are newer and you're getting a little discouraged, go back to one lots if you have to. That's that's fine. Learn from those one contracts and just after six months, if you're breaking even, all of a sudden you got it. Yeah, you You'll know, start to see the money come in slowly but surely. Right. No, I like that. And it's interesting uh, what you just mentioned. I uh, While I'm here at the conference, I ran into somebody that I clerked with, you know, way back in the day. Uh, and out of our clerking class, if you will, of maybe about 15 or so, there's only four of us left in the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody else is off doing something else. Um, So yeah, it's interesting how it's almost like, you know, restaurants, for example, you know, so many fail within the the first number of years. Um, But yeah, I like the idea of, you know, maybe going back to the basics. If if things aren't working out for you, you know, relearn. And and, and there's, I think there comes a time if, if you've been doing this a long time, you know, it's just like almost playing. I, I, I played baseball in high school and college, and I, I, I see a lot of analogies to baseball about doing it every single day. And there's going to be times where you just, for whatever reason, are in a bit of a slump. Mm-hmm. And you just don't have the right instincts, and it's going to happen to everybody at some point. And, you know, you're like, man, I couldn't hit the water if I fell out of the boat right now. Yeah. And so you go back to, okay, I'm going to go to really small trades again. I'm going to get my feel back. I'm going to get my basics back a lot of times i think what happens quite honestly is you become a little bit undisciplined uh and you have to go back to say okay what am i doing wrong let's go back to the discipline of trading let's go back to you know making sure i understand my risk on every trade and you get yourself back in the groove but once every few years everybody i've talked to who's done this for a long time comes into that same sort of uh little short period where for whatever reason they just get out of sync JJ, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Always great to see you. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. All right. Take care. That's going to do it for today's episode of Wide World of Options. Special thanks to our guests, Ariane Adams, Lex Lutheran Housing, and JJ Kinahan for sitting down with us on the road. And be sure to visit the events section of optionseducation.org to register for the continuation of our Summer of Selling webinars. 
Thanks again to all of our listeners and supporters out there. And as always, please feel free to send us your questions via email at options at the OCC.com or live chat with us on our website as we love hearing from our listeners. Take care, everyone, and we'll be talking with you again very soon. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you've heard on today's show, email options at the OCC.com or visit www.optionseducation.org and chat with OIC's Investor Education Team. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Subscribe to the OIC YouTube channel, like them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter at options.edu, and follow their page on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wide World of Options. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.